Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's get into it. Yeah, I'm Trent uh, Van Epps. I am a member of the Protocol Guild, and I work at the Ethereum Foundation as well. Um, however, anything I say here is my personal opinion and doesn't represent the wonderful people at either of these uh, organizations. Um, if you don't know, Protocol Guild is a collective of uh, 150 core contributors to Ethereum. Uh, it's a mechanism for distributed funding. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about that at the beginning and the end. Uh, as you can see, the title is different, so I apologize if you feel um, a, a bit rugged here, but this is a slightly different talk from what I originally submitted, uh, but still uh, like a higher level view of what Protocol, I Protocol Guild is and what it hopes to accomplish, but just from a broader perspective. So um, yeah, we'll get into it. Thank you to the organizers, as always, Franzi and everybody else who's been involved in the volunteers for putting on what's already an amazing event. So yeah, we'll get into it. So uh, big claims that we're going to get into, I think that we should keep in mind. The concept of the commons, if you're not aware of it, um, we'll get into it and describe it and see how it, it's relevant to Ethereum. Um, I also think it's relevant to look at Linux, and that's what this talk is about, looking at their 15-year head start in developing an open source ecosystem, how corporate entities get involved, and um, how they interact with the, the production of software. Um, this is a little more wordy, but uh, one of my claims is that entities which commoditize state production, so taking software and doing things with it, they have the greatest capacity and the greatest incentive to actually uh, enclose the commons. And then finally, the commons infrastructure should be funded as close to the source as possible. Um, and like I said, that's Protocol Guild, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So here's the overview of the uh, summarized version of what all that is and what we're going to talk about. What are the commons? Uh, get into Linux and Ethereum, how they are commons and how they are enclosed, and then finally Protocol Guild. Uh, this talk is really heavily inspired by a book called Incorporating the Commons uh, by a, um, an author named Benjamin Birkenbein. Recommend you check it out. It's a really excellent overview of Linux and its relationship to corporate entities and, and how they... Um, contribute to and extract from the commons. So uh, definitely recommend checking it out if you're curious about these things I'm talking about. So let's start with a really high level definition. What are commons? Uh, historically, these um, described physical resources that are shared or collectively managed. Um, forests, fisheries, pastures, uh, really long history around the world. These are were prevalent, uh, especially throughout the medieval. This is what a lot of people think of medieval commons, where you have uh, people sharing pasture with sheep, and you know they're doing sustenance farming. Um, but over the last 20 or so years, this has been brought into digital commons uh, to include things like scientific knowledge, public data sets, uh, Wikipedia, for example, is like a body of knowledge that people contribute to and, and people gain benefits from uh, using, um, and as well as software like Linux and Ethereum. And there are some important differences between physical and digital commons that uh, can be described in this, this two by two. And the, the two parameters or the two characteristics that you can compare them against are excludability. So can I prevent other people from using this resource? and rivalry. Uh, once, it's con once I consume it, does that prevent somebody else from consuming it or using it? Um, and so what we're interested in is the bottom right side of this 2x2, two two, which is knowledge commons, code, uh, free software, like I said, Linux and Ethereum. And um, we'll get into why digital commons have these unique properties and, and what makes them a little bit special. So I've developed this framework. Hopefully it's accurate. If there are any uh, people who are more well-versed in the commons uh, literature or research, please do come correct me afterwards because I'm, uh, yeah, limited experience. But this is sort of what I've came up with of how commons are manifested. So at their core, they're always composed of individuals. You don't have AI agents, at least yet. Um, maybe there'll be individuals someday. But it's individuals bringing their own context, their own experiences. Um, their own preferences, um, you know, their uh, lived experience, they're bringing that alongside their labor and um, their work into uh, the second bit of the diagram, which is they're bringing all of these things into frameworks of production. And this isn't just like, um, I do this work, you do that work. It's the social relationships, it's the political arrangements to how the commons, uh, the output of the commons is governed. Um, 
uh, it, there can be economic incentives. There's a whole bunch of different things that you can use to structure and govern how the, the, the commons is produced. And this is an important uh, uh, part of that, or it's an important thing that um, contributors get when they are helping to produce the commons. It's, it's not just the output, it's also the rights and obligations that they're constrained by as uh, a result of participating in this, this framework. And so at the end, like I said, there's the commons, there's this, this output, so um, Linux and Ethereum, there's this body of software that people can use, um, and it's, like I said, structured by the relationships and the labor of the people who are actually doing the work. Uh, another important concept that we'll, we'll touch on is enclosure. So enclosure is the process of appropriation by private interests, and historically, uh, like I said, the medieval um, image of commons where you had your local lord would show up and he could capriciously say, um, you know, actually I want to use this field for my own use or, and, you know, it happened in a bunch of different ways over, over time or in, historically um, through a bunch of different formal or informal methods. Um, but because it's a physical commons, it's a physical good, it could be uh, taken by, by threat of force or through other methods like that diagram shows just somebody shows up disregards the social means of production or the social relationships that manifest this shared resource and they can just take it. Um, like I said, physical and digital commons, they have different attributes and one of the things about digital commons is that they can't be, they can't be claimed in the same way that um, physical commons can be fully appropriated. Um, Benjamin, uh, the author I mentioned earlier, calls this incorporation where you have corporate entities sort of inserting themselves into the commons production process. Um, but in, in crypto and Ethereum, we, we are familiar with the terms of capture or coercion, co-option of the production process. So it's these entities inserting themselves into the production of the commons and trying to influence, for example, how the Ethereum protocol is uh, constructed or, or made to their benefit. So these are the two questions we'll get into next. What are the unique characteristics that digital commons like Linux and Ethereum have and how do they get enclosed or uh, appropriated? Um, so, very brief intro to Linux. Um, it started in the 90s by Linus as a student, um, and today it's been called the largest collaborative development project in the history of computing, as well as a cancer <laughs> by a former Microsoft CEO. Does anybody know who the CEO was? Let's do some participation. Does anybody know the name? Steve Ballmer, yes, whoever, you win something. Um, but yeah, Steve Ballmer, uh, I said this and he's pretty famous, Microsoft has had this, this hater arc, which they've, they've changed over the years. Maybe they still have this core of hate, but um, they really didn't like Linux uh, when it was originally coming out. Um, and this, uh, this diagram here is super pixelated, but it's, it just demonstrates over the, the, the past many years how it's blossomed into this incredible array of uh, different distributions, different versions of software fit for different use cases, and it's, it's uh, pointed to often as a success story for uh, how open source software can be constructed and, and used on a large scale. So going through the same framework, you have open source devs that come, they're interested in contributing to this product, uh, or this commons software, um, and they do this through floss norms, so free, libre, open source software is what that stands for. Um, you know, they're collaborating with each other, they're helping each other review PRs, that's, there, there's a whole um, cultural norm that goes into um, collaborating on software like this. There's also the benevolent dictator for life social dynamics, so Linus is, has a lot of sway in the community, He's um, a very present voice and people trust his opinion, so there's this social dynamic of uh, people trust what he has to say and what he believes the software should do in the future, uh, as well as things like uh, the GPL license. This is an important legal structure that constrains how people can interact with uh, the things that are coming out of the commons. So all of these things, and probably some others which I haven't listed, are really important for structuring the relationships of people as they contribute to the commons. And um, as you may have guessed, this produces the Linux kernel. And so this is the, the core component of what people start to build on. Uh, but it's, all, it's just software, right? It's not something that people can actually use to a large degree. And what we're interested in is 
uh, the extended commons, that, that fourth diagram there, um, where the software becomes state, where it becomes somebody using it on their computer. Um, so we're gonna go through how it goes from the kernel to the extended commons and then enclosure from there. So in this fifth, fifth diagram, you have people setting up uh, overlapping relationships to the kernel, um, similar to what we saw in the, the, the previous slide. Um, some of the other ones, uh, you'll see the, the smaller dash circles there are nonprofits maybe. They're still engaged in the production of the kernel. Uh, the Linux Foundation, for example, supports some developers, but they're not actually engaged in the production of state or the software that people actually end up using. Uh, so we have these groups of people that get together, they have an interest in extending the kernel for a particular use case or a particular niche. They gather together and they produce these bits of software. They're called distros. Um, they, uh, like I said, are usually tailored for a specific niche or a specific function, and people decide to use which one suits their fancy or has a specific feature that they're interested in using. Uh, and the black dots in that sixth diagram are the users. These are people who are actually taking the software and running it. And what ends up resulting is that that's where the state is produced. Uh, on the edges of the extended commons, you have the starting from the kernel, moving out into the distros, and then you finally have users. And users are, of course, an important part of any commons, or you have the people that are using the software, providing feedback, uh, helping to understand how to improve it. Um, but then we get into corporations and enclosure. And uh, there's a couple different ways in which this happens. Uh, the first one um, in the top of that, that first diagram would be something like Red Hat, where they have a community distribution, uh, but they also have uh, a fork of that, and, or it's upstream and downstream, and they then create a, a corporate product. Uh, they commercialize the output of the commons and then extract profit from it. So that's one way, or you can have the, the one on the right um, in that eighth diagram where there's a much larger company that just makes their own product. And so what, what I'm trying to show here is these uh, companies overlay themselves on the, the production process and the, the relationships, the norms, the ways that the commons infrastructure is produced and try to do something with it to their own, their own private gain. So the ninth diagram, they have employees contained within this commercial infrastructure or this commercial wrapper, and that gains them access to the relationships of production, like I said, the governance, uh, the rights that contributors have as part of this uh, commons production process. Uh, a couple caveats, um, companies buy enterprise software for a reason, they want it to have a high quality, uh, a high guarantee of quality, they want uh, guarantees of support, there are reasons why they exist. Um, so this isn't to say that all uh, commercially produced software is bad. Um, I just want to point out that there are ways that commercial entities, and this is what um, Benjamin gets into in his book, is that the, the, the relationship between um, commercial entities, their, their boundaries become porous and start to integrate and overlap with, in unexpected ways, the, the production process of, of the common software itself. Um, and the good thing is licenses, uh, like the GPL, do prevent overt abuse. Like I said, there's, uh, it's a digital good, you can't claim it for yourself, and then the licenses are another defense which prevents people from actually uh, claiming this digital good and preventing other people from using it. Um, but over time, uh, it's possible to um, lose, uh, it's, it's possible to have a, a really negative posture towards the commons. So these examples are from the past few years where Red Hat has changed its stance. It started as a, um, a uh, purely open source company uh, building on Linux and over the years it's changed its stance and uh, as a result a lot of open source developers are not as comfortable contributing to Red Hat type products. Um, so yeah, what matters is their posture towards the commons, whether they're contributing in a pro-social way um, contributing funding back, resources, and giving knowledge back to the, the, the software that's being produced. So now let's get into Ethereum. Uh, you have core devs, again, individuals with their own context, their own experiences, their own desires, who want to help build the Ethereum protocol. Passes through, again, the floss norms, uh, additional norms, uh, cyberpunk norms, uh, things like censorship resistance. We want to build protocols which uh, can't be compromised or co-opted easily, allows users to accomplish what they want without necessarily relying on intermediaries. 
um, as well as frameworks like the Alcor Devs Call, the EIP process. These things all help to structure the relationship of these individuals as they produce the Ethereum protocol. And the uh, analogous output to um, the Linux kernel is the execution and consensus specs. Um, so again, that's the output, but a key part of this is the governance process, the relationships that people have as they, they build this software. Um, so again, we'll, we'll look at the extended comments. Where does state production actually happen? Uh, and astute observers might know I'm using the exact same set of diagrams, just with different text, because the process is very similar. Uh, so we have the extended comments. People gather to implement the core specs in a specific way, um, and today we know that as client teams and node operators, not client teams, but um, specific client implementations, which are then uh, operated by nodes, and they produce, in the seventh diagram, a single global state. This is an important distinction between uh, something like Linux, which is um, producing single instances of state, uh, isolated on someone's computer or somebody's server, and uh, which makes it more amenable to enclosure or capture by a private corporation because they can you know, set up a, a user um, provider relationship where they, again, give guarantees about how the software will be supported in the future, things like that. Whereas this global state, uh, it's, it, the reason it's valuable, the reason it has network effects is because there's no single party that's providing guarantees, right? It has um, guarantees of decentralization, censorship resistance, and these come from it uh, being a distributed system. This, this is a distributed ledger that runs on many different machines and produces a single global output. So this is a key difference between something like uh, Linux and Ethereum. And it does provide important benefits because um, it's much harder for somebody to capture, uh, for example, to go make their own private chain we all know how that went uh, a few years ago when it was popular to create a consortium network or a private chain. These things aren't popular or they, they don't really have a use case because uh, it's, it's negating the, the key benefit of what these public open blockchains are. So um, yeah, to summarize, that the, the key takeaway from that seventh one is that it produces a single global state. So what's the analog for corporate entities? So L2s are not necessarily all corporate. Usually they have a foundation or um, some nonprofit that's also uh, associated with stewarding the layer two, but they have a similar relationship to the core. They might fork one of the client uh, implementations and create their own version. Uh, they might pay consulting fees to client teams. Um, these are two of the ways in which they sort of embed themselves within the commons production process or, or the extended commons that is Ethereum state. Um, or in the future, we might have a really a large uh, FANG company decide to produce their own client and you know they have a significant interests outside of the Ethereum commons that will trickle into, um, uh, th their interests will trickle into the commons through the employees as shown in the ninth diagram. So again, uh, it's probably clear the sequence of diagrams at this point, um, but I think it's uh, just, just useful to point out the specific uh, ways in which um, corporations overlay themselves over the commons, over the production of uh, these, this digital software, and what they gain is access, like I said, exactly in, in Linux, it's the same output or the same outcome where these corporate entities may have um, uh, the capacity to influence the development of the core protocol. Uh, I don't think this is the case necessarily today, but um, I guess what I wanted to point out through this, this sequence of diagrams is Linux has been doing this for 15 years longer than Ethereum, and there are useful um, things to look at and learn from. This is a very surface level exploration of um, you know, these two ecosystems, but I think it's very interesting, the parallels, and I think on a deeper exploration, uh, many more interesting um, examples would come to light about co-option or, or ways in which commercial entities have abused the knowledge produced by the commons, have abused the relationships that are uh, contained within the commons for own, their own private gain. So um, I hope that we will think about this in the future as Ethereum continues to grow and just be aware of the influence of commercial or for-profit entities. Um, that being said, it, non-profit entities can be bad too, right? 
It doesn't necessarily um, mean that all uh, nonprofits are good. It, it just depends on their posture and their relationship with the production of the commons, whether they care about uh, having a good relationship with the people who are producing this software. Um, so yeah, some more caveats. Uh, I'm not saying that commercial entities are default bad. They do host a lot of useful functions for core contributors. Some of those are like legal services, training, visas, health insurance. These are important and you know, people make the decisions that make sense for them. Um, similarly, producing state is not bad. Obviously, we want block space to be av uh, available to as many people as possible. Um, and the way that you do this is by, you know, L2s, they need to produce state. It, it's going to happen one way or the other. Um, again, what matters is your posture back to the commons, whether you're giving back, whether you're a, um, a positive contributor to this software that underpins the production of block space. Um, and like I mentioned, there are some inherent properties in the Ethereum network that are beneficial. It produces a global state, which is not as easy to partition and profit from because the benefit is that everybody's producing this single uh, global state, um, which has network effects. Like I said, private blockchains were a thing. I don't think they will be in the future, but maybe maybe I'll wrong. we'll see. Uh, more caveats. I didn't touch on MEV, which is like commodification squared or like the worst version of, of what I touched on here, but on an extreme level where you have this supply chain of uh, state changes that are, you know, mutated and, and manipulated in ways to extract even more profit for these, these, these actors. Um, that's, that's an entirely, could probably be an entire talk by somebody more experienced with MEV than I. But um, yeah, this is, this is a, uh, because there's a global state, this is one of the disadvantages, is that there's ordering concerns, there's uh, a supply chain that exists to extract more value. So while there are benefits to a global state, there's also some disadvantages. Um, but I also mentioned this before, um, uh, there is, what we hope to do in the future is just scale block space to as many people as possible and hopefully avoid the outcome where you have a few large entities who got here early, a few large L2s. We wanna make block space as cheap as possible uh, for as many people as possible, make it ubiquitous. And so this is sort of like a preemptive commodification, but without somebody attaching themselves to it or an entity intermediating uh, and trying to extract from the, the commons block space that's being produced. Uh, and this is where I'm gonna Bring it back to Protocol Guild. If you were thirsty for some Protocol Guild content, another way that you can um, avoid intermediation by commercial entities, if we're worried about the negative effects that they can have on how the protocol is governed, how people engage with it, we can uh, fund the individuals directly, right? We give them more autonomy, give them the option to be independent politically, independent socially. Um, again, not saying that everybody needs to stop working at a company and become the, the sovereign individual developer. That's a bit insane. Um, but we should have options to fund the individuals who are actually maintaining the commons and producing this, this software that everybody else uses. And cue the Protocol Guild, which is a collective of 152 core Ethereum contributors today. So um, it's a, yeah, an on-chain mechanism which directly funds individuals. Hopefully you see the resemblance in that diagram. This is the, the commons production, uh, the set of people who are participating in commons production. Um, uh, uh, of course, it's, it's, there are more people outside of Protocol Guild that help to build the core Ethereum protocol. The, the core commons then are represented in this organization. Um, but this is, this is one such organization that, where you can fund the individuals that are actually um, making this Ethereum commons and all the ridiculous applications that are building on top of it um, possible. Uh, so it's an on-chain mechanism. If you've never heard of this, this is just a really quick intro to what it is and why it's important. It's an on-chain mechanism and the funds go directly to individuals. So every quarter we update the membership and um, try to make sure that it's as accurate as possible. Uh, over the last year, we raised and distributed 15 million directly to these individuals and we're uh, gonna do the same with the next version. We're doing some improvements. Uh, uh, a new smart contract trying to make um, the next version of the protocol much more robust. And um, if you're curious about learning more because it's on chain, you can go check out that dashboard right there on Dune. Um, and as the, the wrap up to the wrap up, uh, it's a bit ironic, but Red Hat has already done this. In, 99, in 1999, they 
um, they IPO'd and they collected a list of all the contributors to the, uh, the Linux database or the, the Linux code base at the time, and they tried to include them in the IPO by giving them some shares. Uh, so it's it's a little ironic that um, you know they did this many years ago, and now they're you know like I said, their arc has uh, changed for the negative, whereas Microsoft has changed uh, for the positive, for the most part. Uh, and now we're here in Ethereum in 2023, and uh, hopefully learning from what Linux has done in the past, the Linux ecosystem and um, maybe taking into account how corporate incentives, corporate entities have intermediated on the commons production. And uh, like I said, there's, this is a very surface level uh, exploration, um, but hopefully you saw some of the parallels that I've, I've found as I'm doing some research and you can, uh, maybe you have some suggestions or thoughts um, about Linux and Ethereum, the parallels between them. Um, that's all I have, thank you for listening.